Hello and welcome back to KXAM Plus. I'm your host, Esmeralda Zamora, and today we have our Weather Answers with Rich segment with, of course, our KXAM meteorologist, Rich Siegel. Rich, thanks for joining me. How are you doing? Let me lower my seat so I'm your high. Oh, no, I'm going the wrong way. I can there adjust go. that for you, too. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, we're doing, doing good today. We've got a nice day once this fog burns off, and then we've got uh, uh, some really cool weather coming up at the end of the week. We had some really cool weather late last night um, into early morning. It's happy. I'm happy to see this rain back here. And it, as you can see, our little camera is extremely fogged out. So yes, it's still zero, very foggy. Z- zero visibility at Camp Mabry right now. Yeah. That at uh, 939. And our first question for our Weather Answers with Rich segment kind of has to do with rain. Yes, right, Rich? yes let's, it does. Let's kick off with that first question. And that first question is, why does it seem like Austin is in a rain bubble? Well, first of all, it's a phenomena. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. In the recent past, we saw that the rain uh, inundated the entire area. We had just as much rain in Austin as we did out in the Hill Country and more rain in Austin than we did in areas off to these. But going full screen on the graphic, this is due to the Balcones escarpment. The escarpment creates a rise in elevation, as most people who live here know, And that can disrupt the rain coming east, coming out of the hill country and onto our viewing area because there is that big drop-off in elevation once you get past the hill country through the western part of uh, Travis County, Hayes County. And sometimes these storms get disrupted and there will be rain in the hill country. And then once it reaches Austin, it stops raining. But then as the system moves a little bit further to the east, those storms reorganize because there's greater inflow and the rain starts again and Austin has missed out. But as the bottom line says, and I've got a misspelling in there and I apologize for that, it doesn't happen all the time. And certainly in the case that we had last night and on Friday, it didn't. It was nice to see all that rain that we had. Yeah, you know, um, when it starts to rain in the hill country and we miss it here in the metro it it does kind of feel frustrating of course and things like a rain bubble come into our head but we need to remember that it's it's not true and just like last night we did get that rain and it was so beneficial it was much it really was but unfortunately it only lasted the two days and now we're back in a dry slot for a while yeah there's hope later on oh oh, yeah it'll rain again Well, we have another question, and that is question number two. Why isn't the summer solstice the hottest day and the winter solstice the coldest day? Well, this is due to the Earth and how the Earth releases its energy at various times of the day and at various rates. Uh, The Earth's lands and the oceans take the time to absorb and release the sun's energy. This creates a seasonal lag. The sun, as we know, reaches its peak at noon. The morning is the chilliest, not at midnight, but at 7 a.m. most of the time. So when the sun reaches its peak at noon, it's not the hottest time of the day. That hottest time of the day comes during the afternoon. But let me give you an example. When you turn on your stovetop to heat something out of a saucepan or or, uh, something like that, you're just heating something. When you turn on your uh, stovetop, it doesn't get hot immediately. There's a lag time before the heat really becomes at its maximum. Same thing for the winter solstice. It's not the coldest day. The coldest days come in January and February. When you put something in the freezer, it's not going to get instantaneously cold. It's going to take a while for that food to freeze. So there's your lag time Mm -hmm. in the time. Okay, here I'm going to put this bag of peas in the freezer, uh, but it's not frozen yet, not instantaneously. It just takes a little while, that little lag between the time you put it in uh, the freezer and the time that it's totally frozen. Same thing when you're heating up, for example, like I do, because I love soup. When I heat up soup, you know, when you pour it in the pan and turn on the range, it's not going to heat up. And it's not going to be hot instantaneously. It's just going to take a little while for that to happen. Yeah, it does. And I'm also one of those people that sticks something in the freezer and expects it to be frozen already. <laughs> well, and even though that. I know it's not going to work, <laughs> some someone can only hope, you know? <laughs> yeah, one day. One day it'll work like that. Well, we have one more question here before we get a look at your blog post. Mm-hmm. And the third question is, how can I prepare for cedar season? 
allergies are coming up, right? We have new people that move into Central Texas on a daily basis, and some some of them, like me, when I first moved here in 93, I've been here for that long a period of time, and I have not developed a cedar allergy, and I'm really grateful for that. I sometimes feel the effects of cedar when there are counts that exceed like 5,000 grains per cubic meter of air and on up into the fifth figure. Um, I'm not a doctor. I don't <laughs> pretend to be one, but talking to people over the many years, if you are a cedar sufferer or you think you might want to make sure you're not, uh, visit your allergist. But some preventative tips are start your preventative treatment now, and these can come in the form of a nasal steroid. The examples there being Flonase and Nasacort. You should begin... It's as early to mid-November, the earlier the better for that. Some people who have lived here for a long time will take their preventive treatments all year long. They are really good about doing that. Some, when the season is over, will put it off to the side, and then they wait until right before the season starts. Um, again, visit the allergist for best results. So a little fact, a few facts about the cedar. Uh, you can uh, do the skin prick test to confirm if you have that allergy. Remember doing that and my, my allergy yeah. is ragweed, so that's that's what gets me around this time of the year. Uh, an allergist will determine if you need immunotherapy. That may come in the form of an allergy shot with that smaller needle or those sublingual drops, which I hear work very, very well. Cedar season for us usually starts mid to late November. Sometimes the cedar season gets an earlier start, but mostly late November, early December. It ends, supposed to end in February, so we get a peak in January, where we get those really high and obnoxious counts, wind is a, is a factor in how high cedar counts will get. When we get those strong winds and it blows the cedar around, those counts, those pollinators are really working in, against us. Over so, time, yeah. Uh, yes. And so uh, the normal end of the season is February, but we have seen cedar season last a little bit longer into March, and we even have some low counts going into April. But normally, the season runs from around, let's just say, from Thanksgiving all the way to uh, early February. Wow, and these trees... Or late February. These cedar trees are so beautiful to look at, but they are they give us so much trouble, all, yeah. or those of us with allergies, yes. right? And it's on your, very debilitating. Your graphic there, I don't know if it went away. Yeah, the, the first graphic on um cedar trees it said start early that's like the number one thing that you should do yes when you, have allergies. you shouldn't wait until the first time you have symptoms you should be pre-planning for this just like uh you you uh pre-plan a thanksgiving dinner mm -hmm. you know what are you going to serve what am i going to make what are the things i can have other people but you should start your preventative treatment early early and that's right now. We're kind of right before Right cedar now season. is a good time to, you know, again, if you're new to the area, visit your allergist because it's a good idea. It's a good way to determine if you um, might be allergic to the cedar pollen. Mm -hmm. And those little allergy tests, the pricks, they are annoying, but they're <laughs> worth it. They're worth it. Yes, they are. Um, we have no more questions for Weather Answers with Rich, but we do have a blog post, right? Yes. I wrote a blog today. Back in May, we had, um, let me switch to the next page. We had word from NOAA that they were eliminating the, that part of what they did, uh, the elimination of the billion dollar database. And this uh, database talked about all the billion dollar disasters that have happened over time. They were not going to do any additional work on it after December of 2024. So this created a bit of an issue for several of us in the meteorological and climatological societies because this is information that we feel is very important. Well, recently, our media partners and our wonderful friends at the nonprofit Climate Central have taken over the administration of this database. And what they have determined is in the first six months, January to June of 2025, we have had 14 already in the first six months of the calendar year, 14 disasters that have totaled $1 billion, billion dollars or more. Wow. And that includes the Hill Country floods that we had in early July, July 4th weekend, that so far has a price tag of 18 to $22 billion, and that number is expected to grow. Why is this important? Well, there's an economic impact that we need better understanding of. 
for climatologists. It allows those that are working hard to answer questions about why our climate is warming and why things happen. Like, okay, if we're in a, in a global warming pattern, how come we had that cold snap that lasted a week here in February of 2021? It helps climatologists better understand the consequences that these billion dollar disasters have created. It allows emergency responders, policymakers, the ability to plan for future events. This is important information for insurance agencies, but most important at the very bottom line, plain and simple, knowing this information saves lives, can save lives and property. And that is the, uh, what, it, what it's all about. The ability to help people survive this, to mitigate uh, significant property damage. And so this is why that database is so important. And I can tell you that 100% of the meteorologists in this country, those who support the efforts that Climate Central uh, does, are thrilled to be able to have this database at their fingertips now. So thank you to Climate Central for taking over the administration of the Billion Dollar Disaster Database. Yes. and. Like you mentioned, it's no surprise that we're having such extreme weather right. um, lately in the last couple years, um, over the la past few years. So this is, like you mentioned, very, very important yes. for saving lives, especially. Yes, indeed. We were so happy when we got the notification from them. And I got to visit with one of their members yesterday and uh, said, thank you. Oh, because, that's so yeah, it's important. It really is important information that we need. And all of that information is also on your blog that was just published recently on like our website. Like within the last 10 minutes. <laughs> yes, Thank right you, Jules, this. for doing the quick proofread. <laughs> it's ready for everyone to read. We've got some great graphics. Talk me through these graphics that you have on here. First graphic is the, so far, January to June, the, the, the disasters that have happened across the country. You go out to California, the L.A. wildfires. Fires. As, uh, was the most costliest, and then those some of those purple ones, those are tornado disasters, Oklahoma, and through the Mississippi Valley. We've had the not hail. only the floods here, but we had a, a severe hail storm in the DFW area in mid-March, and then you have a few others off to these. The second graphic, as you go down a little bit further, those are the billion-dollar disasters that we've shown before on Weather Chat. Kristen and I have talked about this going back to 1980 when there was an average of under five to now we have uh, we get numbers into the 20s of these disasters. And then right below that, it shows a bar graph comparison of where we are in 2025 versus the average, which is below the 2025 line, um, and the two years that were record years, uh, 2023 and 2024, when we had 28 and $27 billion disasters, respectively. So those are what the, what the graphics are. And then below that, I, I always try to throw in a little information on these things, so you know the database and who took it over and why it's important to know. Awesome. So people have a better idea of what I'm writing about. Some information on NOAA and more of the statistics are in here as well. If you want to see some money signs, you can see how much it costs, yes. how much the damage damage costed. The 14 billion dollar disasters that we've had so far through the first six months of 2025 have cost 101. Point Four billion dollars. Wow. And there's still half the year that they will be accounting for, including the last uh, two and a half months or two months and a week of this year. God, we're is... already at the end of the month. I know. We're all already on Halloween weekend, Rich. Yes. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Sharing this blog. Um, it's very important. So if anyone is interested in reading up on Rich's blog, it's on our website, kxan.com. And you can rewatch this video after. It'll be on there, too. Thank you for joining me, Rich. Thank you, Esme. And we will see you next Sunday.